There are a lot of videos out there about running the numbers for a rental property when you buy it or when you already own it. But what about running the numbers when you sell a rental property? And especially, how do you know how much you're gonna pay in taxes when you sell? My business partner and I have bought, sold, and still own over 100 rental properties. It's our main source of income, and every once in a while, we sell one of our properties. So in this video, I wanna show you the details of one particular rental property that we sold not too long ago. And I also wanna show you how I calculated how much I would owe in taxes after that sale. And don't worry, if you're not an expert in accounting, I'm gonna explain this in simple terms that anyone can get. And I'm also gonna offer a free spreadsheet calculator towards the end of the video. So stick around and let's get started. If you're new to the channel, I wanna say welcome. My name is Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach. And this is a channel all about investing in real estate, achieving financial independence, and doing more of what matters. Right from the beginning, I wanna let you know that the tax side of real estate investing is something not talked about enough, and that's why I'm making this educational video. But I also wanna remind you that taxes can get complicated and every individual situation is a little bit different. So I recommend that you do like I do and hire a professional like a CPA or a tax attorney to help you actually advise on your particular tax situation. So before we get into all the numbers and the tax implications, I wanna give you some background on this particular rental property just so you can get some context. This rental house is one we bought in 2006. It's a three bedroom, one and a half bath, ranch style brick house. So very typical for our area in the upstate of South Carolina. We bought it in 2006 and we sold it in 2019. So we ended up holding onto it as a rental property for a little bit over 13 years. And I wanna say up front that this was not a great deal for us. It wasn't the best end result. We ended up not losing money on it, but we had negative cash flow on this property for the first seven to eight years of the property ownership. Part of that was paying too much for it. Part of the, the financing that we got in the very beginning was at a higher interest rate and just didn't have a lot of room for cash flow because we were paying so much on the, the loan. And also probably the biggest issue was there was a lot of deferred maintenance. There were some upgrades we needed to do. So we couldn't keep really good tenants. The location was decent, but we needed to put a lot more money into this property to attract the better tenants that we have on, had on some of our other rental properties. And so we just paid too much to be able to, to do that. And it's actually one of the reasons we sold the property, just to move on, get our money back and go and try to find another rental property. So let's take a look at the simple numbers for this rental property. And in a way in real estate investing or really any business, it really comes down to how much did you pay for the property? What's your total cost? And then what did you sell it for? Because if you know those two numbers, you can then subtract them and figure out the difference, which is called your gain, also known as your profit. So in this case, we sold the property for 119,000. That's the price that our buyer paid for it. And our total cost was 98,500. Now I'm gonna get into some details of what that involves, but this includes things like the price we paid for the property, it includes the closing costs when we bought the property, it includes any improvements we did to fix up the property and make it more valuable or any capital expenses. Like if, I'm not sure if we replaced the roof on this one, uh, actually we did right at the end, but anything like that, any improvements, closing costs, and then commissions and closing costs when we sold the property, all that's lumped together for now just to keep things simple. But the difference between those, when you subtract 98,500 from 119,000, is 20,500. And this is actually pretty close to what we got as a check at closing. So we paid off our debts, the other things we had on the property, and we ended up having a check for 20,500. And you would think in a simple world, you would just go pay taxes on that, whatever the capital gains tax rate is. We're gonna look at that on a spreadsheet a little bit more detail. You think you would just pay taxes on that, but there's one other layer complication when you own assets like this, when you own real estate assets, and it's something called depreciation. And before I get into more of that math, I wanna take a side, side trip here and explain a little bit more about what depreciation is and why you need to know about it with a rental property. This concept of depreciation is a tax term, which when you take it outside of all the normal tax jargon, is actually pretty simple to understand. And I wanna explain it to you. It just represents the fact that anything, any physical object in the world deteriorates over time. So you can see my beautiful artistic rendition here of one of your rental properties. And it starts off brand new, we hope. Or at least most of the things are working, at least when it was built in the very beginning, it was all brand new. But you know from the very beginning that every single component of that house has a lifespan. It's going to wear out at some point, whether it's 10 years or 100 years, things in that house wear down. For example, the roof of the house, if you put an asphalt shingle, might have a life of 20 to 30 years. That's pretty typical. And a lot, there's gonna be a lot of variation depending on other things. The brick on the side of the house might last a lot longer. The driveway may be longer. The heating and air system, less than the roof. But overall, 
the IRS has acknowledged that your rental property, the physical part of your rental property is gonna wear out over time. And so they, there is a table basically, and each component of the property, so the residential building component of the property, they've given a term of 27 and a half years. And so for, for tax purposes, that just means that your rental property as a whole wears out over 27 and a half years according to the IRS. So what does that mean? That means that, for example, if the house component of your purchase, so you have to separate out the land, but if the purchase price of the house is $150,000, you divide that by 27 and a half, so 27 and a half years, so that you get $5,454 per year in what's called a depreciation expense. But step back and think about this. You've already paid for the property up front. You either borrowed the money or used your own cash. So this expense isn't something that comes out of your pocket every year. Yes, you might need to put some, side, some money for maintenance. You're probably fixing up some things and you need to set aside some money for that roof when it eventually wears out. But this is an expense that doesn't necessarily come out of your pocket, but it is an expense on your taxes. So what does that mean? What if you had $5,000 that year in rental income that you would typically pay taxes on well, if you have this depreciation expense of more than $5,000, you actually do what's called sheltering your income from taxes. So this paper loss of depreciation, it shelters your income from taxes, at least the rental income, so that you save money on taxes. And that's one of the big benefits that a lot of people talk about with rental property. And that's great for a time. But the issue here is that when you go to sell the rental property, the IRS gets the money back. So that when you sell the property, even though you've depreciated it, let's say in my case for 13 years, and you benefited from that tax savings during that time, you have to pay the piper. You have to pay, you have to re, do what's called recapturing that depreciation, and you're ending up having to pay taxes on it in the end. And so I wanna show you a little bit more complicated calculation that I referenced earlier to show you how depreciation fits into this equation when you're selling a rental property. Remember when I showed you the numbers the first time, I said it's really simple. You gotta figure out what your total cost is, you gotta figure out what you sold the property for, and the difference between that is your gain. Well, I wanna show you how it gets a little more complicated with depreciation. Now remember that number that I had, 98,500, that was our total cost in the property. And that included a purchase price of 83,000, that included closing costs to buy it of $1,200, it included improvements of 5,200, and it included selling costs, which was the commissions and closing costs when we went to sell the property of 9,100. So that totaled up to 98,500, nothing changed yet. The issue though, was the depreciation. So during that 13 years, we benefited from depreciation expenses in the amount of 36,500. So we saved some money on taxes because we offset some of our rental income during that time. But when we sell it, we have to recapture that depreciation. And the way that happens is it reduces our cost basis in the property. And I'll explain what that means in a second. But you, you take 36,500 and you subtract that from 98,500, and you get the number 62,000. So our basis in the property for tax purposes is 62,000. It's as if we bought that property for a much lower price. And what that means from a tax standpoint is that we're gonna owe more in taxes when we sell it. It's like we had a much bigger gain than we originally did if you just looked at what we invested in the property. And this is called your adjusted basis. So now that we know our adjusted basis, let's go back to that original formula to try to figure out what is the number we actually gained on this property so we can eventually figure out how much taxes we owe. So here we are, we have 119,500. Remember, that is what we sold the property for. And our new, newly calculated adjusted basis is 62,500. So when you subtract 62,500 from 119,500, you get a taxable gain of $57,000. So that's the total amount that the IRS is gonna look at and say, you're gonna owe taxes on that total amount. But there's a little bit more nuance there. Remember, 36,500 of that amount is what's called depreciation recapture. And so we're gonna treat that in one way when we calculate taxes. And then there's another portion, the leftover portion, where we actually gained on the property, where the property actually went up in value of 20,000 500 and that's going to be treated as what's called a capital gain so we're now ready now that we have those two numbers we can now proceed to the next step which is let's try to figure out or at least estimate how much i would owe in taxes on this rental property now in order for us to be able to figure out what you actually pay in taxes on the sale of a rental property i need to make a couple of points about how the u.s federal tax system actually works. 
And the first point is that as we go through these calculations, keep in mind that the tax rates that we're gonna be using are my personal tax rates. So this is not a corporate tax rate, that's the other alternative that in most cases, mine including mine, but maybe yours as well, you're either gonna own a rental property in your personal name or some kind of entity like an LLC or a partnership. And there's a lot we could talk about there, but the bottom line is from a tax standpoint, you actually don't pay taxes on the level of the LLC. There's not an LLC tax rate. You actually have a tax return for your LLC, but it all, all the income flows through to your personal tax return. And so you're gonna use your personal tax rates. That's the first important point. And so in order to do that, you would look at what's called your taxable income. Now on your tax return, most of us use on our personal tax return, what's called a form 1040. If you go all the way to the bottom of that first page, there's something called your taxable income. And so that's the number we need to start with in order to determine what our tax rates are going to be. Now I wanna make a, kind of an aside here, is that keep in mind that your taxable income is not the same as your total income. In fact, a lot of tax planning is about reducing the total income and the amount of money you actually make and put in the bank account and reducing that amount by having deductions. You have things like a standard deduction on your tax return, but there's also, you can contribute to IRAs, to HSAs. There's a, a list of entrepreneurial tax deductions, tax savings that reduce the total income down to your taxable income. In my case, it's actually a really big number. Like my taxable income in that in the year 2019 that I'm gonna be evaluating here was just under $100,000, but the total income was probably over $200,000. I don't have the total number right in front of me, but it's a big number if you're contributing to a lot of these tax deductions. So I wanna just let you know, keep that number in mind, but in order for to determine your tax rates, you gotta use your taxable income. And there's really two buckets that you need to think about in your personal tax rates. One of those is called capital gains tax rates. So we're gonna look at some tables here in a second to show what those rates are, depending on how much money you make. And then there's also ordinary income tax rates. And so the ordinary income tax rates are what you would use for your salary, for rental income as well, and also for depreciation recapture. But there's a little asterisk there because there's a cap on depreciation and capture tax at 25%, at least when I'm recording this here in 2021. So let's unpack those a little bit, but I wanted just to get those distinctions out of the way before we jump into the numbers. So I'm gonna go through two different ways that I have used to calculate the taxes that I owe on a rental property. The first, as you can see here, is a spreadsheet. And by the way, you can get this spreadsheet for free by looking at a link above me here on the video somewhere or also in the video description. So just click on free spreadsheet and I'll be happy to send that to you. And what the spreadsheet does is it helps you to get a rough estimate of how much you're gonna have to pay in taxes by basically rounding up a little bit. And I'll show you just a second how that works. And this is so that you can set aside some money, at least in my case, for those taxes in that moment. So you sell that property, you get a check in the bank account, and some people have the temptation to go spend that money, but you need to allocate at least a portion of that to what you owe in taxes, set it aside. If you pay quarterly taxes, you might have to go ahead and pay it now. You could talk to your CPA and about when you need to pay that. But the point is, you need to do this quickly up front, do a rough estimate. And then the second calculation I'm gonna show you is a little bit more in depth, but it's after the fact when I'm doing my tax return to figure out how much did I actually owe in taxes on the rental property. So let's first go through this example with the spreadsheet. And so you might be familiar with these numbers. You recognize them from when I went over them earlier. My purchase price was 83,000. The closing cost 1,200 bucks. Improvements 5,200. Closing cost 9,100. So my total cost basis 98,500. You remember that. And the total depreciation 36,500. So I can get my adjusted cost basis. So I just did the same math we did on the on the prior screens. And then we figure out what did I actually make? What's my gain or loss in some cases on the sale of this property? I sold it for 119,000. And by the way, if you're using the spreadsheet and you wanna use it for your own rental properties, the values in red are the ones you wanna change. Don't touch the ones in black because those are automatically gonna be calculated for you. And so 119,000 minus 62,000 equals a $57,000 gain. That's the taxable gain that we had on this property. So all that's a review, but let's look down here at what the actual tax rates are. So this is gonna be dependent on your state. There's a state tax here as well, but let's look at the federal at least. So remember that out of that 57,000, 36,500 was depreciation recapture, and then 20,500 is capital gains. So let's start with the capital gains. That's actually a little bit simpler. And so I would need to figure out what is my tax rate for capital gains. 
And if you want to click, you can actually click on a link I provide there. This is just to another article. There's plenty. If you just Google capital gains tax rates for a particular year, you'll find all sorts of uh, tables out there that show you based on whatever your taxable income is. Remember how we talked about what that number is, taxable income. Then you figure out which rate you are. And in this case, my taxable income was 15%. So that was the bracket that we were in. There's actually a lower one and there's a little bit higher one as well but this one was 15% for me. So that is what I plugged in here in the spreadsheet. And so 20,500 was my capital gain on this rental property. And that, to be accurate, this was actually the total capital gain between me and a business partner. So remember, this is my personal tax return. So actually my portion of that is just half of that, but I'll get to that in a second. So 20,500 was a total gain and the federal taxes uh, would be 3,075. And so there's just a formula in there that says 15% times 20,500 is $3,075. So that's one portion of it. But remember, there's the other portion, the depreciation recapture. And this is where it was just an approximation. So we just used the number 25%, which is the maximum amount you would pay for depreciation recapture tax. It actually, as you'll see in the next, next part where I go over my actual taxes, it could actually be less than that because this is your ordinary income tax rate. But all it says is that if you are tax rate on this depreciation recapture is more than 25%, then you just cap it at 25%. So we're just using that number as a kind of a worst case scenario here. So 25% times 36,500 is 9,125. And so what is the total there? The total that I owed, uh, or actually my business partner and I owed, if we had the same tax rates, would be 12,200 for federal taxes. So out of that $20,000 or so that we've put in the bank, you know, 12,200 would be, would go to federal taxes. That's an important number to know, but we're not done yet because some states have state income tax. Depends on the state you live in. Some states don't have any income tax. My state of South Carolina does, and there's a 7% tax rate for ordinary income, but there's actually, if you hold a property over two years, this is according to my CPA, by the way, thank you, Brandon Smith in Greenville, South Carolina, give him a little shout out and I'll put a link to him in the video description below as well. It's pretty busy CPA, but has done a good job for me. Um, so $1,686 is the tax rate on the depreciation recapture. And the tax rate's the same on both of these, by the way, unlike the federal level. And then 947 for capital gains. So I owe additional tax, or we do, together of 2,633. So the total taxes on this total gain for this rental property is 14,833. But my portion, so this is a rental property. This is, this is a rental company that I own half of. So my portion, I'm gonna type that out as we're going here, is 7,417. So I'm gonna highlight that right here. That is what I would need to set aside and pay in taxes, at least as an, an estimate when I ran this calculation in the very beginning. And hopefully you can use the spreadsheet to run a rough calculation as well. Definitely run it by your CPA, get some help with this, but this is actually a spreadsheet that my CPA helped me put together. Now I wanna take you through the steps to figure out what I actually paid in taxes on this rental property that we sold back in 2019. Now remember, this is the portion that is very individual and particular to you. I'm gonna show you my income and what my particular situation looks like in South Carolina selling a rental property, but you wanna use a CPA or a tax advisor to help you out with these steps. That's what I do as well, but this is actually very helpful for me to break it down and understand it myself, how I'm taxed, and I thought it would be helpful to show you those steps as well. So the first thing to understand here is we're gonna start with the same numbers that we've been looking at previously. The main difference though, is that this is a personal tax return. We're figuring out how much I personally pay in taxes. And remember, I own half of a partnership that owns this property. So all of those gain figures we had before, I'm gonna take half of that to figure out my personal taxes. The second thing is we wanna divide these up again into two different categories. So we have depreciation recapture, that's one portion here, and we have capital gains. And so let me take you through each of those calculations, We're starting with depreciation recapture. So what you have to do with this, this is remember tax at a ordinary income tax rate. So we have to understand what we make in ordinary income in order to figure out the tax rate or the bracket that we're gonna fit in. Now, the best way to understand this outside of this kind of lingo for taxes is to think about the tax brackets like pouring water into a big bucket. So if you, your income is the water, and if you pour your ordinary income that's taxed at this rate into a bucket, there's different levels, almost like marks on the side of the bucket. And as you fill up the water into each of those levels, each of those levels are taxed at different rates. 
So the lowest uh, level is taxed at the lowest rate. The second one's a little bit higher. The third one, a little higher. We have what's called a graduated or a marginal tax rate. And, or another term for that is a progressive tax system where the higher you go in income, the dollar, the next dollar you make at one of those higher bucket levels is taxed at a higher rate. But your lower income levels, that first amount of money you make is taxed at the lower rate. So that's what I'm gonna show you here is that, that I made in 2019, if you look at my taxable income on my tax return, it was 99,100. Now remember taxable income is not the same as your total income. So if you have a lot of deductions, which I actually did in that case, then you can make a lot more than that and save money on taxes. That's a whole nother story. If you wanna know more details about how to look at that and understand that, leave me a comment and I'll be happy to kind of add that to my future video list. But for now, just understand that 99,100 was my number and I, and I entered that up here. And out of that 99,100, the portion that is subject to ordinary income taxes here on the left side is 88,850. So I've just taken out the $10,250 in capital gains, which we're gonna deal with here in a second. So what's left over is 88,850. So that's the, like, you could think about that as water in a bucket. And out of that 88,850, only 18,250 is my depreciation recapture portion. So what I need to figure out here now is what part of that bucket is that depreciation recapture going to be taxed in? Is it what, at what tax rate? So what I did here in the spreadsheet is I took all of the non-depreciation recapture ordinary income and I figured out what brackets they would go in. So that's 70,600 is the total amount of non-depreciation recapture income. And so 19,400 was the first line in that bucket, the first bracket that was taxed at 10%. So we filled that one up. And then the rest of that money filled up the bracket number two, and it didn't go all the way to the top of that bracket. It filled it up to 51,200. So anything above that, that amount in my depreciation recapture income will be taxed at 12%. So what I needed to figure out was out of that depreciation recapture income that I have earned, 18,250, how much would go in that 12% bracket right here and how much would get filled up in the next bracket. So what I did is I just looked at the total, the top of that bracket is 78,950 and we've already filled up 19,400 and 51,200. So I totaled those up and the difference between 78,950 and those two are 8,350. So that's the, the amount of space remaining in that bracket that's filled up by my depreciation recapture income. And that's gonna be taxed at 12%. So that's what I did right down here, 8,350. And that actual tax is where we finally got to the number that I'm paying here is $1,002. But I'm not done yet because remember I have 18,250 in depreciation recapture income and we've only used 8,350. So the other 9,900, fills up the next bracket, which is at 22%. And that 22% times 9,900 is 2,178. So there we go. We finally made some progress. I've got 1,002 and 2,178 in federal income tax on that depreciation recapture. But I'm personally not done because we have a state income tax in South Carolina. And this is a, a figure I got from my, cap, from my CPA. And he told me that 4.62% would be the rate in this particular situation, the long-term capital gains rate, or the it's actually the same rate for capital gains and depreciation recapture in South Carolina, just a little aside, but the rate is 4.62%. And so I multiplied 18,250, which is my depreciation recapture by 4.62, that gives me $843. So now I know my total amount of depreciation recapture tax is $4,023. So that's it's kind of interesting to look at. What's my effective federal tax rate? Remember when we approximated it on the prior one, I said the maximum is 25%. So we use that to be conservative when I first sold the rental property, but I actually have paid a less, less of a tax rate, 17.42% because of my personal situation and where I fit into the tax brackets, 17.42%. So a lower tax rate. But when you add in the state tax, I have a 22% effective tax rate on this depreciation recapture. All right, so that's one portion, but we're not done. Remember, we have the capital gains. So let's go back to that. That's a little bit simpler. I have 10,250 in capital gains, and I have a 15% federal capital gains tax rate for my personal situation. You need to look at a bracket. I've got a link there in the spreadsheet. You can check it out to figure out what yours is in that particular year. We're talking about 2019 in this case. And so 15% times 10,250 is a $1,538 federal capital gains tax. 
Remember, I also have state tax. So 4.62% times that same 10,250 is 474. So I have a $2,011 capital gains tax. And so we're gonna add all these together. I got 2011 plus 4,023 equals a total tax of 6,034. That is how much tax I actually paid on this rental property that I held for 13 years that we rented and then I sold my portion of that tax was 6,034. So you can think about this practically. If we made $20,000 in cash, we put that in the bank and let's say we distributed that money to the two partners. I made half $10,000. He made half $10,000. Well, 6,000 of that gets paid in taxes. So $4,000 left over. I told you this was not that great of a deal. We did save some money on taxes along the way, but at the end of the day, that's about how much money I have left over on this particular rental property. And my total effective tax rate was 21%. So I hope these explanations have been helpful. I know we went into a lot of detail, particularly on this last one. If you got any questions, you got any comments, I'd love to hear from you in the comments section below. So you've been with me from the beginning to the end to figure out how much I paid in taxes when I sold a rental property. If you found this video helpful, please hit the thumbs up, the like button to help me spread the word on YouTube. And if you're new to the channel, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the little bell so you don't miss anything. I have new podcasts that come out every Monday and new videos just like this that come out every Friday. And if you like this video where I go in depth, running the numbers, analyzing a real life rental property, I think you'll like my next video, which is about my very first rental property that I bought 17 years ago. And I go through all the numbers and I'll tell you just a sneak peek, the numbers were a lot better on that particular property. We did better on it. But if you wanna see the spreadsheets and the analysis, I would think you'll appreciate and like that video as well. You've been watching Coach Carson TV. My name is Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach, and this is a channel all about investing in real estate, achieving financial independence, and doing more of what matters. See you next time.